Hello everybody, uh, welcome back. After quite a bit of a break over the last three weeks, I've been getting ready uh, for my uh, annual trip down to Scale Model World at Telford, uh, which I did last week, and I was intending to do two things uh, for the show. The first one was to get the Bismarck finished ready for uh, the competition. Uh, I didn't manage to do that because I was waiting on one or two items that I wanted to fit and I just was found myself uh, rushing in the last few days. I should have had it ready probably the month before in September or October but uh, with uh, other things that I've been doing in the shed I didn't manage to do that unfortunately. So there's always next year. I'm sorry for anybody that was expecting to see it down there but I really didn't want to rush the uh, running so as I said next year uh, I'll be down there with the Bismarck. One of the reasons why I didn't get the ship finished was because I was working right up to the uh, last minute on Thursday, in fact, with the Lancaster that you can see here uh, over my left shoulder. And uh, I managed to finish that in time, ready for the club display, 617 Squadron display, but that took quite a lot of time. That's a build that I've been doing over on my uh, Patreon channel. But uh, now it's time to get back into the swing of things and catch up on a couple of projects that have been uh, taking a bit of a backseat uh, for the ship and the Lancaster. The first of which is this uh, special hobby, Tempest. I think there's been five episodes of this so far. And in this particular episode, I want to uh, get the stencils finished uh, and some of the weathering done on the model. For the stencils I'm going to be using this which is a set of one man army stencils. As you know I've already uh, done the national insignia and the squadron codes and serial number using a Montex mask. They're all present in this particular set but this includes some very high definition stencil masks and uh, it's the first time I've used them. I had a long talk uh, to the uh, manufacturer at Telford where I got this set. Uh, about how to apply them so I'm going to do a little bit of experimentation it's not uh, quite routine to use these so there's one or two new techniques to learn and I'll try and illustrate those uh, once I've tested them out for myself uh, so that's what we're going to be doing this week and hopefully get the model to the stage where we can get it flat coated and the last details fitted in the next and final episode so I'll clear the bench away, let's get the ship moved and uh, hopefully we'll get this work done on the Tempest. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, One Man Army masking set first of all. I've got one or two decals to fit to the model as well that isn't provided in this set for the squadron badge and the victory markings at the side. But uh, apart from that everything else is provided. And speaking to Sven down at Telford, he uh, gave me some samples just to practice on, which is this little thing here. Uh, but he also gave me another sheet. So this is the main sheet for the Tempest that's provided in the set, which is uh, this one with all the national insignia and the stencils on it. Uh, and also this with the squadron codes and some uh, extra serial numbers on it as well. But uh, we'll come back to those in a moment. I'm going to do a little bit of a practice on this uh, spare sheet that uh, I was given. Just to see how they go on and how much paint to use and so on. Uh, I think the knack with them is not to use too much paint, very light coats at uh, fairly low pressure. You don't want to flood these because they're so delicate. Uh, we'll take a close-up look at the Tempest uh, ones in a, in a moment. Uh, the other thing that was very helpful was how you use a uh, demonstration of how you use transfer tape. So here for example where you've got this letter B code, uh, you use transfer tape to uh, first of all, take the B out, the letter B out, and use transfer tape to lift both the border and the internal parts of the B uh, together. And when that's applied to the model, obviously the uh, whole of the B stays in shape. Uh, I don't think we're going to come across that because I've already done the squadron codes as you've seen earlier on in an earlier episode. 
but uh, we might need it in one or two places so that's a useful trick to know about. I will practice with that B just to see how it works uh, and I'll also try one or two of these very fine stencils just to check that I know how to use those and get the best result from them. It might be that I need a little bit of practice with this uh, that might not get it exactly perfect on this model but uh, I'll do my best it's the first time I've used it as I said so we get uh, a generic set of instructions here a user manual how to use the transfer tape how to use transfer tape to use layered masks so for example on a c-type roundel where you've got uh, four different colors this shows the sequence of lifting each one up and painting each layer so that you end up with those four colors in perfect alignment so those are generic uh, instructions we also get obviously a detailed set for the tempest which shows the position of all the stencil markings which is what we're going to be doing uh, in this video so quite a bit of work and uh, I think what I'm going to try and work out first of all is how to position the stencils such that you get them in exactly the right place. I think that's going to be the most difficult thing to do. So in terms of the set itself we get two sheets of you, as you've seen. This one has the codes for the kit and a serial number. The other serial numbers for the other scheme options are here. Full set of national insignia which I'll keep for other projects. But uh, just to take a look at the stencils, they're absolutely remarkable really how they are uh, cut out. I'm assuming it's some sort of laser technology that does that because the size of them, if you can see next to my fingernail, my little fingernail, how tiny uh, those are and they're absolutely legible. So I'm going to do some practice with this set first of all on a piece of scrap. Okay, so let's have a little practice with these. And I'm going to use this one here. Uh, the little X in the corner, you won't be able to see it, but there is an X there. That uh, means that it's a spare, which is good. It's very useful to have. So I'm just going to gently remove that and apply it to the practice piece. I'm not going to bother too much about lining it up. I just want it to go over some of the uh, rivet detail just to see how it copes with rivet detail. And we'll just press it down gently. just extend the border not that it matters for the test piece but I just want to check that I can get the paint on with a 10 millimeter piece of masking tape around it I think we should be alright with that. So the instructions advise us to push the mask down with a piece of paper rather than directly with your fingers. Okay so uh, I've got some Tamiya XF1 in the Harder and Steam bag and I've got the compressor set to 10 psi. We'll start with that to see how it goes and uh, the paint is thinned about 50% so we'll just use that as the first experiment. So very small amounts of paint to start with, we mustn't flood the mask.
you are advised to uh, approach the mask from different angles just so that you make sure that the mask is filled this is Tamiya acrylic thinned with lacquer thinners so it does dry pretty quickly Now the actual stencil mask has to be removed very slowly, we're told. Okay, so as you can see the mask has come off nice and clean. The detail on that tiny lettering, which is probably half a millimetre high, is absolutely razor sharp. It's an absolutely amazing product. And whether or not I've just been lucky there, but the 10 PSI pressure is about right. And the paint mix, my usual paint mix actually of 50%. Uh, looks to have worked as well. So uh, I think we'll have a go at the aircraft, at the model, and I'm going to start with the undersides just in case I do make any mistakes of positioning, but hopefully we'll uh, be able to get some of these stencils fitted. So let's have a go. Another tip in the instructions is just to mark off the centre of the stencil. Just gives you a visual reference as to where the stencil is going to lie when you've got it fitted. Now obviously I can fit several of these uh, before painting them. They're all black, there's one or two white ones which we'll do separately. Uh, but I'll press on, get the rest of these positioned on the underside and then we'll apply some black, hopefully we'll get a good result. Okay that's all the stencils on the underside of the wings masked off. It's a little bit tedious cutting out all the extended mask pieces but uh, it has to be done. So I'll get the black on now and hope that uh, the results as good as the test piece. Okay, so we'll uh, hopefully this will have worked.
Okay, so uh, I'm happy with how those have turned out. And in terms of time, I think really overall the time it takes to apply them accurately, mask off the surrounds, paint them and remove the masking is probably much the same as applying the decals and especially stencil decals which are uh, often prone to silvering as we know and very difficult to apply. Uh, by the time you've used the microsole, microset and taken care to apply them all let them dry and so on then it's probably just as long to uh, mess about with decals as it is to apply these stencil masks and uh, I think wherever the uh, stencil masks are available and the re range is increasing quite a bit quite quickly then I would decide to use them I think the effect is much better than a decal and uh, the obviously zero risk of silvering so uh, it's quite a development in modelling, I think, really. So I'll carry on applying the rest of the black stencils uh, to the airframe. And then we'll go back onto the top surfaces, do the top surface stencils, which are mainly in red. So we'll see if they're any more difficult to get the correct effect with the red paint. Okay, moving on. Next we've got the uh, red markings, which are mainly the datum points and the uh, fuel fillers. Okay, let's do the red. This is uh, Vallejo, which I very rarely use. It's just that I'd run out of uh, Tamiya flat red. This is the RLM red, so I think it'll be about right. It looks a little bit bright, but it's going over a very dark green, so we probably do need to brighten it up a little bit. Let's give it a go. Now let's uh, see how this red looks. I've just taken a couple of the datum markings off and they've come out fine. They've actually covered obviously a little bit better on the grey because it's uh, paler but it's still quite visible on the green as well.
So I think overall they've uh, the reds come out okay. Uh, I think it does need a slightly bright red to go over the, uh, particularly the dark green. But uh, I'm pretty happy with how they've turned out. So just to do those red stencils has taken about an hour which I think is more or less the same time as it would have been to apply the uh, equivalent decals to the model. The only slight difficulty I've had with them is getting some of them positioned, particularly this large uh, break-in uh, marking here. I've got it slightly off, it's slightly far forward, but uh, once the aircraft's weathered I don't think that's going to be too noticeable. Uh, it's just a lesson to learn to be uh, maybe just a bit more careful positioning the stencil next time. But that's the downside of using uh, a solid kabuki tape. Uh, it's just not possible really to see through so maybe a bit more careful marking off uh, would have done a better job of that. But uh, overall I'm fairly happy. I've just got uh, some white data marks to put on the underside. Uh, once they're done, I'll do those off camera and then once they're done we can just put the uh, three or four decals that we need to uh, on the model. Okay, so let's get these uh, decals fitted. We've just got a pair of squadron badges which goes on the fin. So this is the three squadron crest, which I think is a mythical creature on it, uh, a cockatrice if I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong about that, but I think that's what it is. And there's actually no photograph of this particular airframe uh, with this squadron badge on, but there's a very famous photo of Klosterman sitting uh, just at the top of the cockpit of this particular aircraft and you can see the other squadron aircraft behind him all with these badges on so you've got to assume that uh, NV994 was uh, fitted out just the same way. So I'm going to fit them, it adds a bit of interest and colour to the model as well. We also have Klosterman's scoreboard which is uh, slightly controversial I think in the number of victories that he claimed but I think that's something to do with the way that the uh, claims were counted. So these are just the four that we need. We've also got the name of the aircraft, the Le Grand Charles, which was uh, fitted on the escape panel. So I'm just going to be using some microsets and we'll test a little bit of microsol on them if we need to. We probably will because the special hobby kit has plenty of rivet detail on it. So I just want it to settle down into that detail. Just try a little bit of sol on that. These are manufactured by Edward, the decals, so uh, they shouldn't be too much of a surprise.
Okay, I'm starting with the first process in the weathering stage now, which is applying this AK panel liner. This is for grey and blue camouflage, which is quite a dark grey wash. It's an enamel product, so it can be removed with white spirit. And uh, it's very versatile. I like to use this. It's uh, a bit better, I think, than the Tamiya panel liners. And we can work this with a cotton bud to stain the surface. And bearing in mind that this is going over the uh, splatter template pre-shading. So we've already got some broken paintwork on this uh, aircraft and this just takes it to the next step. We'll do some later on in the build, probably in the next video, uh, just to add to that, but we'll see what this first stage looked like. I like to build up weathering gradually. So I'll be doing this uh, starboard wing using this and we just want to apply it really to the panel lines. I don't want too much on. But uh, one of the things that I've found with this particular model is that all the rivet details fairly well defined. So it looks odd if you don't get all the rivets lined as well. But rather than brush paint the wash into all the rivets, I just use the cotton bud to blend uh, the wash that I'm putting on now into the rivet lines. You'll notice that I haven't done the wing walkways yet, they'll come later. I'll add those once the flat coat's on. AK do quite a range of these panel washes in different colours. I've actually got a set for uh, different applications. But I like this one for grey and green. This was quite a new airframe when Klosterman uh, flew it uh, late on in 1945, May 1945. So it didn't get an awful lot of use. Although the photographs that you do have of it show that uh, there's quite a bit of variation in the paintwork. So we want to try and replicate that with this uh, weathering stage. So I'll just work around the wing. You can see the other advantage of doing all the markings in paint rather than decals, which is that the wash goes into all the panel lines where sometimes that's difficult when you've applied decals to a model. This is a very versatile process because you can work with it for quite a long time and blend it till you're happy with the effect that you get. And if you haven't got enough on, you can always add some more. If you have too much, you can always remove it. And you can remove it to the extent of completely cleaning the airframe up as well because the enamel thinners or white spirits or mineral spirits as it's called in the States uh, doesn't affect the acrylic paint underneath. So it looks a bit of a mess at the minute but don't worry about that. This is really versatile stuff. You can do what you want with it really. Okay, let's uh, play around with this now. The wash is nearly dry. It doesn't have to be perfectly dry all over. You actually want some of the product on the cotton bud because that helps to blend and stain the paintwork. So to blend this, I just generally use a circular motion just to work the wash into the paintwork start to create some shadow effects as well
pretty well blended. Let's get a fresh uh, cotton bud now. I've just missed one or two areas that uh, you can go back in just to uh, pick out those rivets and a little bit more work around the maintenance areas these are the cannon base here so obviously the armourers would leave the mark on that area So with the wash applied fairly equally over the airframe or the section that you're doing I then want to get some streaking effects into the paintwork using the wash and you can use uh, a cotton bud like this that's got some of the wash on it and obviously just draw it back in the direction of the airflow over the wing. And again this is a stage that you can play around with until you're happy with it. As I said this wash is very forgiving. Okay so uh, I'm going to carry on working on the airframe and uh, get the wash blended until I'm happy with it. Uh, once I am I'll leave it to dry for a day and then give it a coat of Tamiya lacquer flat just to seal everything in and at that stage I'll be ready for the uh, next and final episode in the series where uh, the main jobs are to build the undercarriage fit the engine and just finish the aircraft off with all those little bits of uh, detail so uh, that'll be next up in part 8 which I hope I'll do uh, next Friday uh, get this one finished and then we'll be able to start with the next aircraft project. So thanks for joining me for this one everybody and uh, thanks for your messages while I've been absent for Scale Model World. So uh, really appreciate it. Uh, as I said hopefully we're back on schedule now with some more regular updates on the channel. Uh, so for that next one see you soon. Bye for now.